This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. All right, so another draft in the books, Greg, and a lot to talk about, a lot to sift through. Let's start with Mac Jones because that's where we began on Thursday night when we did our late podcast that we went live, and we appreciate everybody who joined us that night beyond 1 a.m. Just, you know, crazy, passionate Patriots fans. Mm -hmm. Thank you to all of them. Uh, But let's start with Mac Jones because I gather, and listen, I don't have a chance (laughs) to really sit down and, and listen to Boston radio. So I gather on Twitter that uh, there's a certain show that you are on from time to time <laughs> that uh, had some kind of beef about Mac Jones and, and how that came about. The idea is, I guess, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea is the Patriots, if, if they really liked Jones, they should have moved up and they should have drafted <laughs> him. There's another storyline about possibly Robert Kraft forcing Belichick to take Mac Jones. Let's start with how the Patriots were able to acquire Mac Jones. They stayed at 15. They Mm -hmm. drafted him at 15. Should they have moved up, Greg? Should they have done something different? Of course not. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) look, and I, and I, and I love Felger and Mass and I'll be on with those guys today. And I'm sure this is a big part of what we'll talk about. Felger's straw man argument. A couple, he has a couple straw man arguments on this one, you know, so this one, it's, it's not giving him enough juice. So he's got to, he's got to inject a couple straw men into this. Um, number one is that, and look, I, I, I could, I know that there are people who are saying this, but that, that he keeps talking about like that, that some people are saying that the Patriots were smart. They were brilliant for staying put at 15. Now, look, I understand there are plenty of people out there including those in the media who think that um, when Belichick farts, it smells like roses. Like I understand that. Okay. But I don't know who he's, who he's listening to, who he's getting this from about that, that the Belgium, that the Patriots were brilliant to stay put at 15. Um, Maybe it's some of the Belichick acolytes in the media, but look, um, I, I, as far as that storyline goes, I I don't I don't think they're smart. I just think that they they read the board well, and yep. and there's a couple of reasons. And and we'll get into this. Will take us into the Mac Jones discussion and the pick. There are different things that go into play when you're in the draft. When you're in the draft at that spot, every spot really you have all this intel on other teams. So so the Patriots knew. First of all, answer me this, Nick. Is Mac Jones, considering today's NFL, is Mac Jones the type of passer he is for every team in the league? No. Okay. How many do you think, how many NFL teams do you think a 1980s, 1990s pocket passer is sort of what they're looking for in the top half of the first round? I could buy San Francisco. I could buy the Saints. Yep. I could buy possibly like, Minnesota because Kirk Maybe Cousins five or is, six. Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe a handful. Yeah, maybe a handful. So we're already starting there. So you've already eliminated most of the league. Now there are different mechanisms, Nick, that, well, I mean, first of all, the next layer is, all right, well, who has the ammunition to come up? And look, you could make the argument that the Redskins – the Washington football team could have come up with Scott Turner as their offensive coordinator. He's been with um, Ron Rivera in Carolina yep. was yep. Cam Newton's offensive coordinator. I wouldn't say that Cam was their perfect candidate. You know, you think North Turner, Scott Turner, you think of Troy Aikman and guys like that pocket passers. So yes, I think it was there for them to come up. Do I think Mac Jones was sexy enough for Daniel Snyder to go stand on a table? No. Um, you look at who's they drafted over the years, what kind of quarterbacks, what kind of quarterbacks Daniel Snyder likes. Um, so, and you also had the bears. Does, does Mac Jones really fit what Matt Nagy, the chief system sort of looks like, you know, when he had, when he basically got his job because of Patrick Mahomes? No. So you're narrowing the field with every layer. And so this all goes into the decision. Do we stay? Do we trade up? And here's yep. the final thing, Nick. 
which people don't really understand, which I haven't talked about before. And I don't know how good my explanation is going to be, but just let's just say there's this term in the NFL called freezing the pick. And basically what happens, you you heard about all these pre-draft trade discussions that the Patriots were having. Oftentimes what goes on, they, they'll just have, oh, we're just checking in. Sometimes they talk to teams and they say, look, there's a guy that we want. We think he's going to fall to 15. It might not. We're going to protect ourselves. So let's say they talk to the teams in the, uh, you know, from the Carolina Panthers on down. Right. And they talk to them and they say, look, let's have some, if we offered you X, Y, and Z, would that be in your ballpark if we were coming up? And they say yes or no. I mean, it's not a hard discussion. So they're not, they're not really getting after it. Basically what you're doing, Nick, the bottom line is what you're doing is you're baking in a right of first refusal for certain draft picks. So I'm sure, I'm sure that when the Vikings were on the clock and the Jets came up, that there was a discussion between someone on the Vikings and someone on the Patriots that said, and I don't know, sometimes they get into specific teams, sometimes they don't. And and I don't think people really want to dick around Belichick, so they probably do tell him. They'll be like, look, I got the Jets on the other line. They're coming up. And the Patriots are probably like, well, the Jets aren't taking Mac Jones. They just took Zach Wilson. Right. Yep. What do we care? Yep. So – that goes on. So you combine all of those things, and it's not that hard to say that Bill Belichick read the board and said, you know what, we got a good chance that Mac Jones is going to be there, who is our quarterback, who is the quarterback that we want. Why on earth would we trade up three or four spots, give somebody an extra first-round pick or a second-round pick or what have you to move up, what, just so we look like we really wanted the guy? I mean, look, I love those guys, but it's a, it's just a completely ridiculous argument. Mac Jones, as we talked about the entire time on this podcast, Justin Fields was not for them in that range of the first round. I think he would have been under consideration towards the back half of the first round. And I'm not even sure about that, but Mac Jones was their guy. I was told that they had pretty good intel that the 49ers had switched from Mac Jones to um, Trey Lance. Trey Lance. And and so, as we talked about before, I thought, from all my discussions, I thought the Patriots, the, the, the first three quarterbacks that they had with top of the first round grades were uh, Trevor Lawrence, Trey Lance, and Mac Jones was the third. We went back and forth a little bit on Justin Fields or Mac Jones, but I came – around pretty quickly that it was Mac Jones. And so they sat there, they got their guy. What? Cause it wasn't sexy and they didn't make all these moves or some, somehow something wrong with it. It's just, it, it's just not factual. And I think, look, I think Belichick played it perfectly. Does that mean that he's a genius or they're smart? No, they just read the board. Right. And I really considering all the circumstances that we just talked about, I don't think the board was all that complicated for them. Yeah, if you're going to come at this saying, well, they didn't trade up to get their guy. They didn't trade up to get their guy. First of all, did they need to? No, they did not need to. Mm -hmm. Secondly, if you're trying to come at me with that opinion and that take, you're pretty much going off of that the Patriots had no intel, right? Because your your argument is, oh, well, if they really, really liked the guy, they should have moved up. Well, not if they had the intel. And, and what Greg is saying is, some of the intel is very easy to figure out. Some of the intel is all about relationships and connections that you have in the league. So if the Patriots knew that Mac Jones was not going three, look at the rest of the teams down the board. Who logically would take it? Uh, you know, right. I never bought into Detroit taking a quarterback. No way. They, they were going to have their pick of Penne Sewell or, you know, maybe Jamar Chase or Devontae Smith, a, a really mm -hmm. good prospect. They have Jared Goff. They just restructured his contract through 2022. They're not in a rush to find a quarterback. Carolina did not trade a second and a fourth for Sam Donald to draft a quarterback. They're going to see if Sam Donald's the answer. Denver is another one. They just made the deal for Teddy Bridgewater. George Payton had said for weeks that he was comfortable with the quarterback situation and he, he just wanted to bring in some competition for Drew yeah. Locke. So, you know, you look at Denver and you also throw in the idea of Aaron Rodgers now 
It seems like if there's going to be a team that's going to go hot and heavy after Rodgers, it's going to be Denver. So just look at the teams in front of the Patriots. And I think, Greg, you made a great point. The two teams, there are actually three teams, okay? If you're looking at the board and you're trying to figure out who's going to jump over the Patriots to draft Mac Jones, Mm -hmm. Chicago, as you said, Mac Jones is not a great fit in that offense. If they're going to make a move up, they're making a move up for Justin Fields, which is what happens. The the, the Chiefs system, their least mobile quarterback under all those guys was Alex Smith, and he was pretty mobile. Yeah, And, and then you look at Washington. They just drafted Dwayne Haskins two years ago at 15. They're going to be hesitant to pull the trigger. They gave Fitzpatrick 10 million bucks. Yep. And so, you know, you have a feeling that they're not going to be necessarily uber aggressive with the situation they have. And then you look at the Saints. For the Saints to move from 28 yep. all the way up to leapfrog you, now you have to evaluate whether or not you believe Sean Payton is willing to give up the bounty it would take to move from 28 to anywhere from 10 to 14. And obviously the Patriots said, there's no way Sean Payton's going to do that. He's got Jameis Winston. He's got Taysom Hill. He'll draft another quarterback later on and have that third guy come in. And so, yes, they read the board correctly. And and when you look at this, it's rather simple to me. They needed a franchise quarterback for the next 10 to 12 years. I don't know if Jones is going to be that guy, but they drafted somebody who could be that answer. They stayed at 15 to draft that guy. And they did not have to give up any assets to draft the guy. That is a win. No matter how you, whether you like Mac Jones or you hate Mac Jones or you love Mac Jones, the team needed a future franchise quarterback. They stayed at 15. They got that guy, arguably, in Mac Jones who fits their system perfectly and did not have to give up anything to do it. Another question I have for you, Greg, about Jones before we move on. Uh, Ben Volan went on radio yesterday and said he believes he did say it was his own opinion. He didn't say this was any information he gathered. He said that there was some kind of quid pro quo where Belichick spoke to Kraft. Belichick was given the okay to spend hundreds of millions of dollars in free agency. And the quid pro quo part of it was that Belichick would would draft a quarterback in Mac Jones or draft a guy at 15 if a guy fell to them so they could justify spending the money they did because the quarterback contract would not be a killer. (laughs) (laughs) Um, If you're not watching uh, the video version, it's Greg rubbing his forehead and face and and kind uh, of figuring out what's going on here. um, Okay. Um, A, I think someone's been listening to sports talk radio too much. So now I look, I, I wanted to talk myself through that and try to find the logic, but I, I, I just can't. Um, so it's out of the, so it's just so that the Patriots drafted an Alabama quarterback who completed 80% of his passes, who's known as being brilliant, who already has his master's degree to run the most complicated passing offense in the NFL is just so outlandish that people are just, trying to come up with things. Yeah. Robert Kraft sat down Bill Belichick and said, okay, I'll let you spend all this money, but you have to draft a quarterback in the middle of the first round. Like how does that forget it? Um, no, nothing like that ever happened. Um, the, and we talked about this before. I think we talked about this the day of the draft. Um, I don't even know if the Crafts knew what the Patriots were thinking on the quarterback. As far as I know, it was Belichick and Josh McDaniels. I mean, there are pretty significant people in the building who would have conversations with Bill and try to get get stuff out of him, and he wasn't giving anything up. They were a complete, like I said, a total lockbox on what they were doing. Um, Look, let's just say, for argument's sake, that the board went a different way. A, let's say that the let's say the 49ers took Mac Jones. Let's say Justin Fields was still there. I mean, I I don't think anything would have changed. I still think Chicago would have come up and gotten him. And I think the Patriots would have been okay with that. And I think that they would have been like, all right, well, again, they had a plan B. We talked about the depth of the quarterback class the whole time. Like it was very it, it was 
somewhat likely that they were going to have to pick somebody else and get the quarterback second. And who knows where they would have gotten them. They probably would have had to trade up and make a move. Probably the ble- probably the Bledsoe move was what they anticipated to do with the quarterback. And they said, what the hell, let's do it on this guy. We had already worked it out anyways. And so they were going to get somebody. And, and, and who really cares where they got the quarterback? I mean, they, one storyline is they did it for the PR. What you don't think Patriots fans would have been jazzed <laughs> up at a qu- yeah. them trading up at a quarterback at the top of the second round? Does Belichick does Belichick do anything for PR? I mean, yeah, I, I all I, the time. I, I like <laughs> I, he's not spending the fifteenth pick in the draft to win a PR war. It's like it's the same argument about oh well you know if a quarterback falls to us at fifteen, which is the Volan point about the the quid pro quo. Did, Belichick's not going to make that promise to Kraft because he doesn't know how the how the 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 board's going to fall. He like Did, he can't sit there and say, "Oh yeah, I'm going to draft Mac Jones." What if somebody fell to 15 that Belichick had no idea was going to fall to 15? Yeah, what if it was like Pat Sertan or somebody like right. that? Yeah, like if Pat Sertan falls to 15, Belichick's going to go, "Oh wait, I, I can't pick up uh, I can't pick him because I I promised RKK that uh, I was going to draft Mac Jones at 15. That's not how it works. It and, and by the way, the day that Belichick is told to do something for PR reasons in the draft or the day he has to pull a quid pro quo with the owner, I think is the day he walks. Belichick is here because he has that control. That's why he, he has everything running the way he wants it to run. So I, I, I don't get any of that. Let me ask you this. So, wait, hang on one second. Okay, Just right. a couple other things on this. Sure. So. The, the the franchise that won six Super Bowl titles being anti-PR suddenly now in version 3.0 are all of a sudden now PR conscious and they're letting all their decisions be dictated by PR when they still have a sold out stadium. Yes, they went seven and nine last year. The horror that they had one off year. Um, and, and the other thing about this is so with the quid pro quo, did they shake on it? Is that what they do? Do they sit there? Do they have, are they at Davio's, you know, with masks on? And do they talk about it? And then they stand up and they're like, yeah, okay, that's a deal. Yeah, Robert, I'll do it. You give me $250 million. I will draft any bum quarterback at 15 just to make you happy. So is that how it went down? No, like, I, I want to draw the line too, because people will say, well, Nick, you know, he said what he said on Sirius XM during the season. And he talked about how, you know, they sold themselves out pretty much. And it's, a, yeah, what I'm saying is they do not make football decisions based on PR. Now, yeah, Belichick might come out with a few excuses or some would call them reasons. He might try to tell you why things are the way they are during a seven and nine season, but he's not making a draft pick because he's worried about what Tommy and Worcester feels he needs to do at 15. He's not doing it. He's making the pick mm-hmm. that he thinks is the best pick he can make at that point. I mean, just think about his draft history. The, how many times have people busted his balls about reaching for a guy or, oh, he, he drafted that guy. Oh, he dra- another Rutgers guy, another Rutgers guy, another Rutgers guy. Uh, so if if he was so concerned about PR and the picks he was making, I mean, it's just, it's so, it's silly season. People have lost their ever-loving minds because of a seven and nine season. Everybody <laughs> pumped the damn brakes. Like the and first they- 20 years didn't matter and how he did things. It's madness. <laughs> And they be- and they drafted the one quarterback who somewhat reminds you of Tom Brady, who completed like eighty percent of his passes and has won at every level he's been in, and is borderline brilliant. When you know you you need to be brilliant to run this system at its full capacity and all that. And like and for some reason, we need to talk about other reasons that they might have done it. I just I, I just don't understand it. It's insane. You know? And it, you go back to the early nineties, uh, Daniel Jeremiah. I know this been, has been written about a lot. Jeremiah shared the notes from Belichick back in the mm-hmm. early nineties, what he looks for in a quarterback, go through the list. Mac Jones checks almost every single box. This is the kind of quarterback Belichick has looked for, for 30 years that this, this is not a surprise people. This is not a shocker. It's he, he fits every piece of criteria that Belichick looks for. So it's not rocket science with all of that said, Greg, how long is Cam Newton's leash? I don't think it's very long. I mean, I know Mike Lombardi thinks it's a red shirt for year for Mac Jones, but I just don't see that. With with everything I've heard, Steve Sarkeesian was on with 
Gresh and, and Keith the other day talking about how smart he is and and about how he's the type of guy who he gave this great example about like they'll they had a game they'll have a game plan in and there'll be a couple plays against the defense that they're playing that they're like, you know what, we don't have any ready answers right now, but we're just gonna put in the game plan and we'll figure it out later. And like the next day, Mac Jones comes in and says, All right, well, with this play what what are we doing against this defense? Because it's not going to work. I mean, who who has those kind of conversations? Like, there aren't many NFL quarterbacks that have those conversations. We're talking about a next level guy. Look, he's going to have to get up to speed with the, with the speed of the game and all that. And yeah, it's good in the SEC. It's not the NFL. It's going to be different. Look, it's going to be proven on the football field. I think he's the type of kid who is going to dive into the playbook. He's going to be you know, him and Josh McDaniels are going to be like BFFs. They're going to be talking about all sorts of upper level stuff that um, has never been Cam's forte. Cam's more of a, he's a better on the fly player. He's one of the the, the best that the league has seen in recent years. Right. And Mac Jones is just different. He's a before the snap cerebral type of guy. They're just different quarterbacks and that's fine. Um, so I think Mac Jones is going to pick this up pretty quickly. And I think the I think the interesting thing is I, and I and I don't know anything. This is just me, um, just looking down the line and knowing the the players involved and things like that. I think there could be an interesting discussion going on at some point between Belichick and Josh McDaniels about like I could see them being at odds a little bit. Not that McDaniels is going to say anything or we're going to know or anything like that. He's he'll be the good soldier. Belichick's the head coach. You know the way things go on the Patriots, the 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 coaches, whether it's the offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, position coaches, they make suggestions to Belichick. Belichick takes it all in, then he makes decisions. And I could see at some point in time, whether it's in the season or preseason or in training camp, where McDaniel's is just like, look, Bill, Mac Jones is already he's way ahead of Cam in terms of pre-snap reads and checks and things like that, like. We need to go with him. Like at right. least he gives, he gets us in and out of good. Uh, he gets us in and out of bad plays, better than Cam does. That's that's a principle of this offense. Like you got to go with it. And I could see Belichick being like, "Not yet. I'm not ready. Let Cam keep going for whatever reason." And I don't know what the reasons are. Uh, we'll we'll see down the line. But I I have a feeling that um, Bill could say no, and you know McDaniel's could get a little bit not impatient, but just, you know, sort of like, oh, what are we waiting for? That sort of thing. But I do think it's, I do not think, I, look, Cam Newton's going to have to play lights out. Could he do it? Yeah, he could. Um, he's been doing a lot of work in this off season. I see some videos from Dexter Southfield where he's working on his mechanics. And I don't know, there was one, it looked like a Jedi quarterback drill where he, he had a blindfold on and people were clapping and then he had to throw to them. I don't know exactly how that helps on the football field, but He's he a hey, he's trying to he's trying to use the force the force is fl throwing flowing through him, um, so it's possible. And if the as long as the Patriots play winning football, but at some point in time, if they're not, if they're hovering around five hundred, or God forbid, if they're two and five again, it's over, and they're going with Jones, and and that's the end of the story. But it's just to me, it's a it's a matter of when, not if. It's going to happen at some point. It's just how long can Cam hold Mac Jones off? All right, so judging from your comments about Justin Fields, the Patriots were not in love with Justin Fields. They might have liked him, no, but they were not in love with him. Uh, why? Have you been able to gather any information as to why they weren't? No, in love with that guy? everybody's pretty everybody's pretty tight-lipped on that. I don't think if Justin Fields was on the board at 15. Now, you want to talk about maybe owner pressure and things like that. Now, if Justin Fields was on the board there at 15, that would have been an interesting discussion because I don't think they would have picked him. Maybe they saying, would have. Are you saying if both guys were on the board at 15? No, just one. Okay, okay. So if, if Jones was already gone and Fields was sitting there at 15. Yeah, I don't know if they would have taken Fields. And maybe that's when crap pipes up, um, even though I still don't think that would ever happen, whatever Bill wants to do. I, I just don't I, – I don't think they would have taken Fields there, but, but that's just me. And, of course, now the conversation will be for the next 10 to 15 years, Justin Fields versus Mac oh, Jones. Yep. Although I do think that's a little unfair 
because again, what we've seen in different the past is, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Different systems, different personnel. Yep. You know, just because one guy thrives at one place doesn't necessarily mean he would thrive in another. Like, I, I don't know if Nikhil Harry went to another team to start his career. He right. have different, he, he would have different success. So yep. that, that conversation is always a little weird. One last one before we move on to the other picks of this draft, because I want to get to all those guys. Um, you got a little information about Elijah Vera Tucker. We had talked about this on Thursday night after the first round wrapped up. Yep. We both wondered, you and I, if the Jets yep. moved up to 14 to draft Vera Tucker because they might have thought the Patriots were in on him at 15. What'd you hear about that? Yeah, that's why I went and I asked because that it wasn't anything anybody reported. It was just, look, the Jets jumped the Patriots to take Elijah Vera Tucker. And the, the, the logical next step is they must have had an intel that the Patriots were going to take him. They might have thought that. Look, I asked you can make you can make of it what you will i was told it it was quickly dismissed and they were like no nah, he's just a guard for us they were not going to they were not going to take him there um especially with mac jones still on the board all right let's move on to christian barmore obviously yep. patriots made a big time move early in the second round trade with cincinnati they move up they select the alabama defensive lineman your thoughts on the trade up, and I, I was reading some of the stuff that you wrote, some of the risk that comes along with Barmore. Yeah, look, um, in general, with draft picks and the draft, I don't really care. I, I don't have an opinion um, on their picks. They do; they have much more information than I do, and they're good at what they do. And I'm the type of guy, okay, pick your guys. I want to watch them on the practice field. We'll talk in three years. And so we'll see on Barmore. I mean – Physically, in the film that I saw, especially the second half of last year, does he look like a uh, possibly a great NFL player? Absolutely. I mean, he's big. He's fast. Not exactly the most flexible guy. I heard some comps to Chris Jones of the Chiefs. Yeah. I don't really see that. I think Jones is a lot more flexible. He's, he's, a, he's a much better all-around athlete, in my opinion, than Barmore is. Um, I don't really have a good comp on Barmore. I mean, I would... He's more of like a three technique pass rusher. I want to say more like sort of like a smaller, less powerful Indomitian Sue. I was gonna say, um, I think I think the ESPN broadcast, one of those guys, I think it was ESPN brought up Sue as a comp. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the only thing because there's not there's not a whole lot of flash to his game. It's more like power and quickness, and that's sort of the way Sue in his prime won. Now, do I think he's gonna be Sue? No. Um but who knows? Uh, and, and he can play every position along the line. Even Sarkeesian in that interview talked about how he almost basically talked to him, talked about him as exclusively as a pass rusher. He didn't even talk about him. He he. I think he even brought up like you know if, maybe it was somebody else's interview that they said, "Are you going to put him at five technique? Is that the best and and hold up against double teams? Can he do that? Yeah, is that the best way to use him? Probably not." Um. So a little background on Barmore and the pick, because, you know, God forbid there's a segment of Patriots fans out there who are just like, oh, you know, all uh, up in arms at me for what I have reported, and I will not apologize ever for reporting the truth. So this is what happened. End of the first round, I look and see who's on the board. Yep. Everybody does. You're doing your blog post for the next day, best available, blah, 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 and you're looking Christian Barmore's there. I had him going in the first round. Um, everybody thought he was a first round talent. And so, and I saw there were a couple teams in there that do similar to what the Patriots do on defense that have good Intel on Alabama guys. And it just struck me as curious. And so I reached out to a few teams. I said, what's the, what's the deal with Barmore? Why'd you pass on him? Why didn't you pick him? And I was told pretty quickly there are big time issues with Barmore that one team took him off their boards. They just said he is not for us. And another team said they had a late second round grade on him. And look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give anybody specifics because I have sources to protect. And if I gave you the specifics that I have, it would burn a source and I'm not going to do that. And I also don't think it's fair to the kid. If I put out what I know, or at least what I was told by a team, exactly why they took him off the board, 
it would be on headlines all over the country and it would and it would unfairly tarnish the kid before he even got a chance. I have decided to delicately report what I have reported. And basically it boils down to this. There are there are intelligence issues that that permeate him off the field and and just you know off the field motivational problems like all of those things. Now you know, you'll get some people who say, well, he had this social media breakdown basically last year during training camp in fall camp, and he t- took down all his Alabama stuff. I'm out of here, blah, blah, blah. People just leave it as that sort of the reason. No, the essential question is why did he have that meltdown? And what was going on behind the scenes? What was Alabama doing to him in reaction to his actions that they were doing that. So basically they just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of feelings about Barmore that he's just not going to be a very good pro that he is just gonna, it was hard enough for Alabama in their environment on campus in athletic dorms to get them to do what they needed to do now. And this is, this goes with all players. You have to evaluate this. Once this kid gets this freedom and this money, what's he, what's his motivation going to be? Is he going to be there? Does he love football? Things like that. They go into all the evaluations. Now, a couple other things on this. This I, this just recently came to my attention by a very astute BSJ member. There's a YouTube video of Warren Sapp uh, discussing defensive line prospects. And he met and worked out with Christian Barmore. And when the host brought up Christian Barmore and said he's – he's thought to be going in the first round and he's, he's the highest rated defensive tackle in, in the, in the game. And, and sap basically was like, if that guy's a first round pick, then, then, then I'm leaving this country. Like he said, he was basically like a third round guy. Um, I don't know what went on there. Um, so, so all that stuff is involved. Now, look, people will say, well, it's Alabama, it's Nick Saban, it's the the intel that Belichick has. Trust me when I tell you that Bill Belichick is not the only guy who has great intel at Alabama. And the other side of the coin is, and look, I am not comparing these two situations. So I don't want to see any blog posts or any tweets saying like, Bernard compared Barmore to this and that. No, I'm just using this as an example. Everyone thought Bill Belichick got great intel from Urban Meyer and – that didn't always work out very well for the Patriots right. in terms yep. of guys out of Florida. Right. And and the guys from Alabama have not exactly worked out aside from Dante Hightower, really, with the Patriots. So there are some issues there. Maybe Belichick just takes it for granted. He played at Alabama. Maybe he doesn't ask the questions. I don't know. But Barmore is a risky pick that they traded up to get him. Look, on film, he looks great. On film, he's a grand slam to me. But that what you do on the field is like 25% of what it takes to be a, a good pro. And there are a lot of questions around the league on whether Christian Barmore is going to be a good pro. I don't know the man personally. And, you know, I don't have the intel that you have, so I can't speak on any of that. You know, if there are issues and red flags that it doesn't work out, then he doesn't work out. All I'm going to yep. say is, you know, I watch the games and, and I, I I see the philosophy behind this move. And to me, it makes a lot of sense. Yep. You have a first round talent. The Patriots had extra picks. They were not going to make all the picks this year. I knew um, they were going to pick them. That's why I made calls. I saw Barmore there and I was like, son <laughs> of a gun, they're going to pick them. I got to start doing background on him. So, I mean, it, it makes sense. It makes sense, right? I mean, he, he does fit. We can say he'll be out there in the Adam Butler role, uh, you know, relatively soon if he's able yep. to if he's able to get out of the blocks quickly at camp. Uh, so he fits that particular, you know, um, slot on the defensive line. And again, they weren't going to use all the picks, so they overspent. Belichick admitted they overspent a little bit, but on paper it looks good. But like you're saying, Greg, you know, who knows if this guy. Yep. You know, if the red flags cause them to go off the rails, then it ends up being a terrible pick and you wasted a fourth round asset and you overspent on the guy. We'll have to wait and see. But on paper and philosophy wise, it's, it makes sense to me. The pick that was kind of strange to me, and maybe it just was because I thought they were fine on the edge, was Ronnie Perkins. 
but I have read mm-hmm. what you've I've read what you've written about Ronnie Perkins, and you like this pick a lot, Greg. Yeah, I do. Um, he was a guy when I was going through edge people, and most times I would have skipped um, Ronnie Perkins because physically he doesn't really he does not fit the profile for a quote unquote edge player for the Patriots that are yeah. normally around like six foot four, six foot five. He's only like six two and a six two and a half. Um, you know, not the biggest guy, but I couldn't turn off the film when I was watching him. He just, he's just a football player. He kicks ass. Um, I had one scout tell me, you know, he's a tough little effer. Um, (laughs) and like, he just, he like eat nails. He just, and he is, he's nasty. And look, I think physically, and I put this in my column after, after the pick was made, Physically, he matches up almost identical to Dante Hightower. And they do, I think, play similar. Now, Perkins has not played stand-up linebacker all that much. And Dante Hightower was a stand-up linebacker at Alabama, could do a little bit of everything else. Perkins is kind of the opposite. Uh, you know, I would like to see him get a chance at that. Maybe maybe they do. And maybe that, that explains why he's not – maybe he's not really an edge guy for them. Maybe they really want to transition him. Um I'm not sure, but I, 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 Nick, I don't think there was any um, doubt about Belichick's intentions when, when he talked about Perkins after the draft. He just kept mentioning how physical he is and tough he is and physical and physical and physical, and it's just it's it just beats you over the head where you're like, basically Belichick was just like you know the guys we had last year, just way too finesse. Whether it's Winovich. Or, you know, Uche hasn't really had a chance, so I don't want to say that about him. Anthony Jennings, you know, all these guys, whoever you want to talk about, um, we're getting back to getting some nasty. And I think that he gives them an opportunity in a few different spots. We'll have to see how the edge shakes out. We know that it's going to be Van Noy, and it's going to be Judon. And then from there, who knows? But Ronnie Perkins is just – he's a football player, and people are going to love to watch him. A little bit of Trey Flowers in him. Um, that type of player, but uh, I think he has a lot of potential. What jumped out at me in the first three rounds overall, and I tweeted this out at Nixie Radio, uh, you know, it was to me quality over quantity for the Patriots in, in the yeah. early rounds of this draft. You know, they they didn't spend extra picks. They land Mac Jones at 15, quality. They move up to select a guy in Christian Barmore who was seen as a first-round talent, slides to the second round, quality. They select Ronnie Perkins with a compensatory pick, even though they had a number of guys that they could play at the edge. They draft Perkins, who was seen, if you look at a lot of these big boards and draft pundits, he was universally a top 50 guy to all of those oh, you know, draft experts. Mm-hmm. So again, you get a guy who's ranked in the top 50 for a lot of those pundits at 96 or 97. It's, it's once again quality over quantity which i mean which i thought made sense for the patriots with the way the roster is after the free agency period they had uh let's move on a running back ramondre stevenson uh from oklahoma of course what was fun about this draft in in a in a, in a funny haha kind of way but you know you had Double jones you had, you had jones and you had barmore alabama alabama then you come back with perkins and stevenson oklahoma oklahoma your thoughts on the running back Bill with those buy one, get one free coupons. Out of those <laughs> those <pools. pools>. Bogo. Bogo. <laughs> Bogo. <laughs> uh, Stevenson, uh, you know, look, he's a, he, he reminds me a little bit of Keith Byers back in the day, sort of, you know, a big oh, back, a little bit quick you feet. Uh, you know, everybody says like Lugier Blunt and stuff like that. I don't see him as, as powerful as that. I see him more of a uh, Keith Byers sort of uh, finesse big man, you know, a little, Quick little feat for a big man, but look, we know Sony Michelle, his fifth year option hasn't been picked up. Um, that doesn't mean that doesn't preclude him from staying with the Patriots. The Patriots could always sign him to an extension. Same thing with Wynn getting the fifth year um option put on him. He's gonna get one, so it's ten and a half million. You could reach an extension, all that stuff. Uh so you know, look, we all know Rex Burkhead's coming back from an ACL. Brandon Bolden's coming from a opt-out year, and he's going in the last year of his deal. Look, the <laughs> for 2022, right now, before this draft, uh, uh, Jesus, what the Damian Harris and JJ Taylor were the only running backs on the roster next year. 
They had to draft a guy. Stevenson looks fine. He has low tread on his tires for a college running back. Big dude. I don't know how good he is short yardage. We'll see in the pros. Um, but yeah, you can see the logic on the pick and they picked who they picked and we'll see how good he is. He also can catch the football a little bit out of the backfield, which is he interesting. Yeah, soft I wouldn't, hands. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say he's going to be lined up in the slot running routes anytime soon, but he can be a dump off option. Big boy. Uh, yeah, he's, he's a big boy. All right, Cameron McGrone, linebacker, Michigan. Your thoughts on that pick? Yeah, coming off ACL, could be a redshirt year for him on film. Um, on film, he looks pretty good. He's, uh, he's a quick striker. He's, you know, he seeks out the ball. Um, you know, the plays that I noticed, um, it wasn't a whole lot of shedding, uh, blockers and making plays, which you're going to, you have to do in the pros. Can he do that? He's a little bit undersized. He, he reminds me a little bit. He plays similar to Landon Roberts. I would say he's a little, he's definitely stronger and a little bit bigger than a Landon Roberts. I would say Roberts at top speed was probably a little bit faster, um, but McGrone is there, and we all know that, you know, Dante Hightower, we don't know what his future is with the team. We don't know who else is playing at linebacker. It could be Uche. It could be Jennings. It could be Juwan Bentley's going into a contract year. Hightower's in a contract year. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we talked about, um, about, about the season and about 2022, a lot of these things they addressed um, with the team as far as making preparations and backing things up. Low including risk. the next pick. Low risk, high reward, I think, with McGrone. I think he drops because of the ACL injury. And, yep. you know, that's the kind of pick you make as you get to the fifth, sixth, and seventh rounds. Somebody you take a flyer on who could hit. And I think McGrone could hit. He's, he's a really good athlete. We talk about, you know, the Patriots needing speed at the second level. He does bring speed to the second level. Now, does the ACL injury affect that? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, Joshua Bledsoe, safety, your thoughts. Yeah, I, I don't know too much about him. Um, you know, probably, you know, special teams guy. Any of these guys after, you know, after Stevenson really are just um they're taking guys that they're they're hoping on. I mean, a blood so we all know then safety's another position where they're losing a lot of guys potentially in free agency between McCordy and um and Adrian Phillips. And uh I think if I remember correctly, I think Bledsoe is more of a box safety type. Um but uh you know, and Adrian Phillips is going to be a free agent that would fit that. But, you know, who knows? I also think that he has a chance to play some linebacker, that sort of thing. Uh, Patriots love these money backer types. People love wide receivers. People wanted the Patriots to spend oh God. an early pick on wide receivers. Uh, they instead draft one receiver, and that came in the seventh round, Trey Nixon. And, of course, this will be forever known, Greg, as the Ernie Adams pick. Yeah, I'm sure Ernie was like, thanks, Bill, for uh, telling everybody this is my pick. So when he bombs <laughs> out, nobody blames you. Uh, but, hey, who knows? Let's, you know, basically he started his Patriots career, you know, his first big hit um, in the current version of the Patriots was, uh, you know, sort of on the fly last minute picking David Givens in the seventh round. So maybe it comes first circle, uh, full circle. Um, Trey Nixon certainly has the physical tools, uh, tested off the charts, productive at UCF, a lot of drops. Yeah. Um, you know, throw them into the mix. I mean, I think I think wide receiver beyond beyond the top three, well, top four between uh Aguilar, uh Kendrick Bourne, Nikhil Harry, who's still here and will probably get another chance. And and then we'll see. I think with a lot of these guys, whether it's Winovich and Jennings and any of these guys that might possibly be of interest in trading for the Patriots, I think Basically, the way the Patriots do it, they they get to camp or at least June mini camp, and they take a look at things and they see how things fit, and they say, "All right, well, he's got a chance, or he doesn't." This is the same sort of thing again. We're getting rid of him, so you know, I think I think Nikhil Harry is has another chance, and you know, Jacoby Myers, uh, I think is right now slot number one, even though I don't know how many three wide receiver sets they're going to have, uh, but and Nixon is just in the mix with any UDFA's guys coming back from last year. Um, he's in the mix. We'll see. Yeah, I'm not telling anybody that Trey Nixon is going to even make the team. But what's yeah. interesting is, you know, when you have wide receiver depth like this draft, 
getting a guy in the seventh round, you know, maybe in other years you would have made a, you know, he would have been a fifth round pick who knows. Right. So, right. you know, m- maybe his value is underappreciated because wide receiver was so deep. So maybe they had a chance. Listen, it's a lottery ticket. The Boston sports journal.com member question of the day, check them out at BSJ 39 99 on their annual plan. Patriots junkies you get a membership at BSJ gives you access to a ton of video analysis. Bedard does on the coaches film and direct access to him in weekly chats. And don't forget, they also have coverage of the Bruins, now playoff bound. Yeah, baby. And they got the <laughs> Celtics. Who knows what's going to happen with them? And uh, the Red Sox. So don't miss out on all the great coverage at BSJ. A popular topic of conversation in the BSJ comment sections, Greg, has been why no UDFAs yet? The Patriots usually pretty busy in that class and get to yep. it quickly. They've done nothing so far. Yeah, uh, a couple different reasons. Uh, and but first, I just want to say, as far as their draft, one of my main takeaways from this draft was they just they went out and got either specific needs, players of fit positions, or um, just good football players. Whereas in the past, we talked about some of their criticisms, like Ju- like say um, Juwan Williams. Is that the same? The cornerback. Yeah, Juwan Williams. Yep. Juwan Williams. You know, look nice size speed prospect or whatever and they're like oh well he can match up against tight ends he could do this yeah but did you ask the question yeah but is he a good football player like they forgot where does he play if he's not matching up against tight ends is he a cornerback can he play like mac jones future qb1 christian barmore future starting three technique um ronnie perkins future edge guy Stevenson, at least a backup running back to Damian Harris. McGrone, a possible Mike linebacker. You know, all three downs that he should be able to play. Bledsoe and the other guy, who knows? They, you know, they're basically flyers. But I think that's my main takeaway, that they they stayed away from, like, trying to get specific and just got good football players, which I think I think they're getting back to sort of their, their, their sweet spot, um, how they built this thing. Um, no UDFAs. A couple of things. Number one. I think that nobody's really sure what the player limit is going to be. Um, Normally it's 90. Last year it was 80 or 75 because of COVID. It could be 80 again. I don't think the Patriots want to go nuts signing people when they're not sure if they're going to need them. Uh, I think they're waiting for maybe a little bit more clarity on that. I think that maybe Bill Belichick liked the 80-man roster last year. And he said, you know what, there's three preseason games. We're not going to have the fourth one now. Do we need all these guys to play in the last game? You know, also, look, we have a whole new team. Um, It's not like we have a bunch of veterans who knew what the hell they're doing who have played together for years. These guys need to go out and play. Maybe they're all playing first halves of these preseason games, and they don't need that many guys down down, uh, the roster. I also think that that there's a new rule where basically – unsigned unrestricted free agents uh can be signed after the draft and not not be held against the compensatory draft pick formula not that that pertains to the patriots because they signed every free agent under the sun so they'll never get a comp pick ever again um (laughs) and uh but i do think related to that and and this is where i think it comes i think that i think that they might sign some veterans um and, and the this could be the cheapest that they're going to be uh, depending on their, their interest around the league. And I also think that you're going to see a lot of people after the draft, a lot of guys, whether it's uh, you know, guys who were like the 53rd, 54th man on the roster type of thing. Now, all of a sudden those guys are cut and there's going to be a lot of people available. There's going to be people available in trades. I think they're just leaving themselves a lot of flexibility, and they don't really see the need to get to 90 anytime soon. All right. Well, there you have it. This was a little bit on the long side, but hopefully yeah, sorry, all Nick. of you enjoyed it. A lot of information for you, breaking down the draft, taking a look at the quarterback position. Again, hopefully you enjoyed it. And, hey, you got maybe you know two car rides out of this podcast versus one with the traffic <laughs> now coming back. Uh, It's the Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattles. We'll talk to you next time.